So the acclimatals. This is group one of the periodic table. We call them acclimatals because uh, the word alkali refers to the bases they are going to form, right? So we are going to study that a little later, but yeah, the name goes for that. If the name of the group consists of the word metal, that means all the group elements or members are all metal. Which means from lithium to pentium, all of them are metal. If I go from top to bottom, this is lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and strontium. Strontium is only the one which is radioactive in this group. The rest are non-radioactive. One of its isotopes is produced during the radioactive decay of uranium. It's extremely short-lived. Uh, at any one point of time, scientists have to estimate there are hardly about 20 to 30 grams of strontium present on the whole of Earth, and no one has ever seen a piece of strontium. Since the isotope is short-lived, it quickly decomposes, and you can't have strontium in good amounts. So we are not going to study the details of strontium in here, because what we can do is that we can predict about it, but we haven't seen it in big pieces. So yeah, the predictions can be correct about it, but not uh, as the case as we have performed experiments with the other members of the group. Moving on, let's discuss with some physical properties. If we look at melting or boiling points or density, you'd notice that the melting point decrease from top to bottom. Boiling points decrease from top to bottom and the density increases from top to bottom. However, there might be some anomalies, but we do not discuss the reasons of, for those anomalies, right? As a whole, the trend is decreasing for melting and boiling, and for density, it is increasing. And you'll also notice that the melting and boiling points of elements are very low for metals, if you compare it with other metals, metals such as group two metals or metals such as transition metals, you'd notice that group one has the least boiling points, the least melting points, not the least, but very low densities as well. The densities tend to increase down the group, although not regularly. Lithium, sodium, and potassium are less dense than water, so they will float on water. The rest can actually sink in the water. The metals are very soft. When I use the word soft, I explain it with this phrase, easily cut with a knife, and they become softer as you go down the group. All of them are shiny and silver gray in color when they're freshly cut, but they tarnish and that means change of parents, right? Very quickly on exposure to air. This is because of reaction with oxygen, which means they react with oxygen in the air and they change their appearance. And they don't stay uh, silver and shiny uh, after the reaction. It's just that they are shiny and silver gray before the reaction, as soon as the reaction occurs, their color becomes darker and a little bit brownish at that. The reason that melting points decrease is the atom gets bigger as we go down the group. In the metallic lattice, the positive ions are further from delocalized electrons, uh, more in cesium as compared to sodium or potassium or lithium. Therefore, there are weaker electrostatic forces of attraction but this is extension work. So usually you don't ask questions about that. Now, since we're talking about these being very reactive and even reacting with oxygen in the air, so the steerage and handling comes as a little bit of a problem. These are extremely reactive and they get more reactive as you go down the group. They quickly react with oxygen in the air, they form oxides, they react rapidly with water, they form strongly alkaline solutions of metal hydroxide, just like the example I gave you off top at the start of the chapter. So that's why group one metals are commonly known as alkali metals, and that's what makes their storage difficult. 
So just to make sure that they don't react with oxygen, they don't react with water in the air, lithium, sodium, potassium are stored under oil. Rubidium and cesium are so reactive that they have to be stored in sealed glass tubes to stop any possible possibility of oxygen getting at them. So we make sure we seal them in glass tubes and we make sure that we take oxygen out of those glass tubes. Great care right. must be taken not to touch any of these metals. Now this is very important with bare fingers because there could be enough sweat on your fingers to give a reaction. They're very corrosive. They're quickly going to eat your skin. They're so corrosive. And this reaction produces a lot of heat. This produces metal hydroxide. And the, yeah, they can use the water at the top of your skin, which you may not be able to see with your naked eye, but they would be able to react. So never touch them with bare hands. You can see lithium, sodium, potassium in front of you, right? Mm -hmm. Moving on. Now this is a family of elements. Why do we put these elements in group one? There are two major reasons why we do that. Number one, if you look at their electronic configuration, you might notice one thing similar. All of them have one electron in their outermost shell. So the last number is one every single time, no matter what the previous numbers are. So two, one, lithium. Lithium has two shells and one electron in the outermost shell. Sodium has three shells since there are three numbers displayed over here and one electron in the outermost shell. Potassium has four uh, shells because there are four numbers displayed over here separated with commas. And of course, the last number is one. So there is one electron in the outermost shell, which is the thing common. And because of which we put them in group one. So the group one means they're going to have one electron in the outermost shell. The second more important and a bigger similarity at that is that they have similar chemical properties. Now, the word similar means somewhat same. It's not going to be exactly same. It's going to be somewhat same. For example, they're all going to react with water as we have stated before, and they are going to form a hydroxide with this formula, MOH, M stands for the metal, replace it with Li in case of lithium, Na in case of sodium, K in case of potassium, so on and so forth. And they're also going to give you hydrogen gas. So the reaction seems to be similar, but the way they react, their reactivity is different. The products, however, are going to be a hydroxide and hydrogen every time. They all react similarly with oxygen. They form the oxide. The formula for the oxide is M2O, for example, Na2O or K2O or Li2O, whichever one you uh, put the formula with, you can make that formula out of it. So they're all reacting with oxygen. Hence the similarity. Number three, they all react with halogens and they give this formula. This is usually the formulas for salts. So they can form salt. If I, for example, I write NaCl instead of it, that would become the table salt we eat every day. However, this is lithium chloride, potassium bromide, that's how they work. M represents alkali metals in here, X represents halogens in here. Halogens is the chapter we're going to study next after this one. And they form ionic compounds and ionic compounds contain M positive ion. They get a plus one charge in them because they have one electron in their outermost shell, which they can lose to have the plus one charge. So the chemical properties depend upon the number of electrons in the outermost shell. And since they all have one electron in their outermost shell, they all behave in the same way. So reason two is actually a consequence of reason one. So similar chemical properties is actually a consequence of having similar number of atoms in their outermost shell. Right? Yeah. Good. Moving on. Let's go with a little bit more detail. Reactions with water. Now, reactions with water is real fun. Have I shown you a video about it? Mm, no. no. So let's see the video because it's going to be really interesting and you're going to learn a lot before I go with these details. All right, so mm -hmm. I'm going to.
Well, I hope you liked it. And I am going to share the link with you after this uh, class. And you can go through that again. And you would literally notice that the diagrams we are about to show you and the details that we're going to discuss with you in the book. And if you re-watch the video after those details, you're literally going to confirm the details with your own eyes. You might have seen how they catch fire, how they move here and there in the uh, beaker of water or whatever flask or utensil of uh, water filled utensil they are put in and they catch fire and sometimes they explode. Uh, the ones that are top of the group explode a, li a little less vigorously and the ones at the bottom explode much more vigorously, tends to break the utensil or whatever thing they are poured in, especially if you're doing it with huge chunks. So this should give you the idea. Now let's discuss the details because you are going to find it real fun. Now, reactions with water, all of them are going to react with water. It's just that this is M and you can literally replace this M with Li for lithium, Na for sodium, K for potassium, Rb for rubidium or Cs for cesium. You can even do the same reaction for francium. Sadly, that was just an illustration back in the video because we don't have such big chunk of francium to perform the experiment as a planet. But yeah, we can always uh, depict how it is going to go. So we make a metal hydroxide for which the formula is MOH, which is the hydroxide, and it produces hydrogen gas. Since hydrogen gas can easily catch fire, that's why the whole explosions that you were able to see. Not just that, this reaction produces a lot of heat, and because of that heat, hydrogen catches fire. Now, as you go down the group, the metal becomes more reactive, the reaction occurs more rapidly. Rapidly probably might not be the word to be able to cut it. You might have seen me using the word explosive, vigorous, yeah. As you go down the group, I would suggest here that you use the better adjective with it. Let's start with the reaction with sodium and water, and that is going to be a real typical reaction. If you look at the video, uh, uh, if you remember that video, you'd understand that sodium was turned into a ball. He used a cube that he put in water, but immediately after reacting, that cube was converted into a ball. Rewatch the video, you'll see it with your own eyes. Not just that, it is going to leave a trail in water, which they have shown mentioned over here, and this ball is rapidly going to move around the surface. Sodium floats on water. This ball floats on water because it's less dense than water. It melts into a ball, ball because the melting point is too low. And definitely, this reaction produces a lot of heat, something that I've already mentioned. Now, this is fizzing because they give off gas. When you give off gas, the sound that you produce is fizzing. The same sound that is used whenever you open up a cold ring or a soft drink bottle. We use the word fizz, you may use the word bubbling, you may use the word effervescence or effervescencing. So it's really up to you uh, what you actually see. Fizz is the sound that we uh, use, uh, fizz is the word that we use for the sound we hear. Bubbling, however, is actually what we can see in the water. Sodium moves around on the surface of water. Because the hydrogen isn't given out symmetrically around the ball, sodium is pushed around on the surface of water. It works like a hovercraft. So here and there, it moves randomly. The piece of sodium gets smaller and smaller. Eventually, it disappears. Sometimes it explodes. You would see the same thing at the end or at, in the video, at the end of the sodium ball when it is getting smaller and smaller being used up in the reaction. Of course, it's going to produce hydrogen and that hydroxide. Now, if you test the solution with a universal indicator solution paper, which we're going to discuss in an organic chemistry further, the universal indicator goes blue and it tells us that we have been continuously saying it's going to be an alkaline solution and flying solution. So yeah, alkaline solutions are represented with the blue color, which confirms whatever we have been saying is correct. Now. Moving on, reaction with lithium. Now, we started off with sodium. Lithium is up top in sodium in the group. However, potassium, rubidium, and cesium 
a place like this in the group. So if lithium is above sodium in the group, the reaction with lithium would be slower, less explosive or less vigorous or less rapid. Lithium, its melting point is higher, heat isn't produced so quickly, lithium does not melt, however the reaction is written in the same way. We just replace the M with Li and Li. If I do the same, I would replace it with K and K for potassium, RB and RB for rubidium, CS and CS for cesium, and it works the same way with francium. Potassium is present below sodium in, in the group in the periodic table, which means its reaction is going to be faster than sodium. Enough heat would be produced to ignite that hydrogen. It burns with a lilac flame. Lilac is closer to purple color, right? And the reaction often ends up with potassium spitting around and exploding. You saw the same thing in the video if you rewatch it. The rubidium and cesium are going to be even more vigorous. They're going to be violent. The reaction is going to be explosive. So I hope you notice we've used the word low for lithium, rapid for sodium. We have used the word violent for potassium. You may also use the word fast, all right? And we can for these together, use the word explosive. So you see how we are using the adjectives to define ourselves. And if you notice the same thing, you see the hint over here, that you need to use phrases in such a way, phrases more vigorously, moves around more quickly, disappears more quickly. You need to use adjectives and words in such a way that we can actually depict how it's going to go, all right? Are we good? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, good. All right, moving on. The difference in reactivity is solely because of, as we do it down the group, the electron is farther away from the nucleus. It's less attracted. It's easier to remove this electron and be converted into an ion and faster the reaction. And the same pieces of details are given over here. Lithium, Electron is more closer to the nucleus, hence more attracted. Sodium is farther away. Of course, we have somewhat a bigger structure in case of potassium or rubidium or cesium. So the easier is the electron removal, the faster is the reaction. And the same thing is mentioned over here. They're also able to react with... Sir? Yes? Is it fine if we stop till here today? 